happy winter, so it's very, very cold outside, so uh, I really appreciate uh, the, the journey that many of you made, maybe through public transportation, I know, uh, so it must have been not too easy to come, but we're glad that you're here. Why don't we pray, and we'll go into our message for today. Holy Spirit, we invite you to move in our hearts. Holy Spirit, we invite you to convict us, to speak to us, to change our hearts, and to bring us closer to the Father. We pray for your power. We pray that we would be transformed by the Word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At Mana Church, there are a, a few staff members who work here who are on diets right now. Now, I'm not going to say who because I don't want to embarrass them, and some of you might know who they are, uh, but there are a number of members on the MANA church, in the MANA church staff, pastors and, and leaders who, who are dieting. And when I'm in my office with them, it's usually very obvious who these people are. You see, in America, it's not that strange to see people eating lunch at their desk. So in America, if you eat lunch by yourself, it's not weird. Uh, people do that all the time, or they don't even go out, they just eat, they'll bring the lunch to their desk and they'll eat by themselves. But in Korea, I noticed that that's not really normal. So in Korea, what I realized is that people almost always go out together. They, they go out in groups, or they go out with their whichever uh, part of the workplace they're the part of, whether it's the technical part or the admin part, they always go in teams. So I noticed that this is the way that Korea works. So I was wondering one day when I noticed that one of the pastors stopped eating with us. Like he was part of our, our group, so he always came with us. Uh, and all of a sudden, he stopped eating with us. And I thought, does he not like us? Does he not? Is there something wrong? Um, is, is he just really busy? So I thought it was really weird. It, it wasn't normal for this to happen. And one day, uh, I was coming back from lunch, and I, I looked over at his desk, and I saw it. I saw this very sad thing. I saw this lunch. It was the saddest thing. It was this little plastic container with a little bit of chicken and a little bit of lettuce. And it just looked so sad. And I realized why that pastor always looked so sad when lunchtime came around. He looked so unhappy because he knew that that's what he had to eat. And so I found out that that's what he ate every day. He packed that every day for himself. And when lunchtime came around, he was so unhappy. And we would go out to buffets and to nice restaurants, and then he would open his container and eat his little chicken salad. Now, dieting, key to dieting is to force the body out of its comfort zone. Uh, so one method to do this, one method that actually a lot of the staff, not, I wouldn't say a lot, but some of the staff at Mana Church, the ones who are dieting, one of the methods they're using is they're taking out sugar and carbohydrates out of the diet. I mean, those are basically things everyone loves, the sugar and bread and pasta. I mean, who doesn't like those things? So they have to take all those things out of their diet. And when you do that, you take away the easy energy. So sugar and carbs, bread, pasta, that's easy energy. That's the first things your body wants to eat. But if you take those things away, what your body does, it becomes uncomfortable and it starts to burn fat. And that's one of the ways that people diet. So some of my friends have, have done this and they've lost lots of weight. They've, they've, one of my friends in America, I think he lost almost 100 pounds. I mean, he was really big, really big guy. And I was so shocked when I saw a picture of him recently. He was very skinny. So he lost so much weight doing this. But what happens is if you stop dieting, your body will go right back. Because our bodies are created to always go back to its original point, to always go back to its comfort point or its resting point. So this is 
the way our bodies are designed. So the real key is not to diet, but to actually change your eating lifestyle. That is the actual key. See, people who go on diets, uh, most of the time, they can never really keep the weight off. They're always going back and forth. So the real key is not to go on the extreme diets where you're really suffering and struggling and, and starving yourself, but the real key is to make some small and important changes to your diet long term. So it's something you can continue to do over time. And this will keep our, our, our physical resting point uh, out of reach. It'll keep pushing our body to an uncomfortable place. So spiritually, spiritually, that, that's what it is like physically, spiritually, in, in our spirits, uh, our resting point spiritually is anti-gospel. We need to understand this. The natural resting place for all of our spirits is the opposite of the gospel. So I think a lot of times we, we fool ourselves. We think, well, I'm a Christian. And I know the gospel. I can, I can tell you the gospel exactly what it is. I've memorized it. I know the Bible. I've read the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament. So as long as I know enough, as long as I know the Bible and know the gospel, I'm fine. But that's like thinking that your body will change because you're an expert on dieting. See, you can read every book on dieting, you can study it, you can get a PhD on nutrition and health, and yet still be incredibly unhealthy and overweight. Why? Because if there is no regular application of that knowledge, it doesn't matter how much you know. It doesn't matter if you are an expert in dieting, if you never apply that knowledge, if it's not something that is your reality. Now, the gospel message, the gospel message is the only cure for our spiritual resting point. Our spiritual resting point, like I said, is this. It is to try to save ourselves. This is where our hearts will go back to every time. Every time, this is where it feels most comfortable, where I can save myself. Save myself through education, save myself through my reputation, save myself through money, save myself through my physical looks, this is the place we always go, self-salvation. So what is the cure for that is the gospel. And what is the gospel? Uh, why don't we read it together, actually? We can have that up, the gospel message. And why don't we read it together? The gospel message, the good news that God has saved us through Jesus to be in a restored relationship with him. And to one day, Restore all of creation, a new heaven, and a new earth. Okay, this is the gospel message. What's scary about this right here, and some of you, you know this very well. You know this message. You can recite it to me in ten different ways. You can give me all the history and theology behind it. But one of the scary things about this is that myself, for myself, I sometimes caught myself trying to save myself through the gospel. Now that doesn't sound dangerous, right? You see what I'm saying here? I would take pride in the fact that I knew the gospel. I was a true gospel-centered Christian. I am so good at preaching the gospel. And they are all Pharisees. They are all, they don't understand the gospel. Look at these Christians, they don't live by the gospel. But I know the gospel. What am I doing? What I'm doing is I'm creating value in myself, spiritual value, because there's an insecurity in my heart. So I want to feel like I'm better than them because I know the gospel. That's self-salvation. This is the scary thing, that we can even turn the very thing that is supposed to cure us into the disease. So we have to remember that the gospel is God's story of how he saved us. It is not anything to do with us. It is 
something done to us. It's something external to us, right? Not something I can control, not something I can earn, not something I can take and put it on myself and say, look, I am a gospel Christian. That's not how it works. It is something that is wholly out of my control that God has done for me. So, I really can't save myself by knowing the gospel better than other people, even though I try. I try. When I, when I let my eyes and my heart lose focus on God, I told you, the resting place goes back to self-salvation, even when it's the gospel. I'll use it to save myself. But what I can do, what is right, is knowing the gospel well and understanding that I have been saved by someone else named Jesus. That is where we need to go. So this is, this is a very small and subtle difference. Uh, maybe, maybe you're not picking it up exactly, but this is the difference between being really sick, calling your doctor, and letting your doctor come to your house and cure you, and being really sick, bragging that you have your doctor's phone number, telling other people, I have direct access to my doctor, and then never asking him to come, and then trying to fix yourself. See, that is the difference. It's a subtle difference. Many times we don't pick it up, but that is the difference. So how exactly, how exactly does God save us? I want us to read together Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Let's read this together. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now what the Apostle Paul is telling us in Romans is that salvation requires two things. There's confession and there's belief. There's these two things. Now, I'm going to pause here for a second and just go back and review a little bit. If you remember from last week, last week I said that there are two ways that God saves us. Two ways. Uh, there is the first level salvation. This is the one-time salvation when we are saved by God when he saves us, when Jesus saves us, this one-time salvation means our sins are forgiven once and for all. We receive eternal life, we are adopted into the family of God, and we receive the Holy Spirit. Right? This is all one-time thing. It's not, it's not a gradual thing. It's, it's not a process. It is black and white. It is on or off. Either you are forgiven of all your sins, or you are not forgiven of all your sins. Either you have eternal life, or you don't have eternal life. So this is not a process. This is a one-time thing. God saves us. And what this is called uh, in theology is justification. Right? You are justified. This is a one-time event. The second level is the process. Well, we become more like Jesus. And this is a process. This is gradual. This happens over time. Now, these two ways that God saves us, God is in charge of both these ways. And both these ways of salvation are powered by the gospel. The gospel is the means for both types of salvation. So a lot of times, Christians will receive that first salvation, you know, forgiveness of sin, eternal life, adoption into the family. They'll receive that you know, that conversion, justification, they'll receive that. But after that first salvation, they'll think, now it's all about changing myself through spiritual works. Right? Trying really hard to be like Jesus. Now is where I have to really work at being holy, whether it's prayer or reading the Bible or serving others. We still think that we have to do it. But that's not the truth. The truth is, any real change after that still happens through the gospel. It is still the same tool. Without the gospel, 
if the gospel is not underlying every spiritual work we do, you will idolize that spiritual work. You will try to save yourself through that work, whether it's prayer or missions or even being a pastor. You will use that to try to save yourself because the gospel is not the core of all of those spiritual works. So whether it's the first salvation or the second type of salvation, the process, the sanctification, it's called sanctification, uh, both these modes, they require confessing and they require believing. And I'm going to go into this now. Uh, confessing, believing. Now, sometimes people call this head knowledge and heart knowledge. Head knowledge and heart knowledge. Right? Confessing, is sometimes people say head knowledge, Believing, that's heart knowledge. Now, with confession, if you just have confession, what you can say, what you know in your head, then you are no different from a demon. You have as much as Satan does. Satan is an expert on theology. He is an expert on the Bible. He is an expert on the gospel. He probably knows the Bible. He knows Christianity better than anyone else here. He could probably teach a course in seminary. I mean, you cannot know more than Satan. He is. He knows everything about Christianity. You see, salvation is never less than head knowledge. You have to know the gospel. You have to know how Jesus saved you. That is the minimum. But salvation is always more than head knowledge. Many people, sometimes they get stuck on just the head knowledge. They think, well, I know the Bible. I know the gospel. But that only brings you as far as demons. The same level. So how does heart knowledge happen? If, if head knowledge is not enough, how does heart knowledge happen? Now, some people call it renewal. Some people call it revival. Uh, there are different ways of talking about it. And when I, when I say the word revival, some of you might think of something very flashy and very loud, and people crying, and dark rooms, and loud music, and people shouting, and, and falling down, and I don't know what you think of when you hear the word revival. I mean, it sounds very intense and passionate, doesn't it? And while revival can look like this, uh, it can look like this very intense moment, I want you to see that that's not always what revival looks like. I want to give you a very simple definition. Revival, what it does is it makes us see our sin. And it gives us the ability to really grieve how our sin has hurt God and has hurt people. This is what revival does. If you are a child of God, the Holy Spirit is always working. Always. Whether you believe it or not, whether you feel it or not, right now, if you are a child of God, He's working right now. He's never not working. He's always working. But revival is when the Holy Spirit really accelerates the power and the efficiency and the results. You really see an increase in everything the Holy Spirit does. So you see more sin in your heart. When the Holy Spirit really accelerates, you begin to all the dark things in your heart. You are more sure of God's promises. You're very confident about who God is and what He's doing in your life. And you have a deeper hunger and desperation for holiness and the presence of God. So this is what revival does. The Holy Spirit just accelerates all these things. So even now, like I said, He's doing those things. The Holy Spirit is revealing sins to you. Uh, he is increasing your holiness. He is revealing God to you. But revival is this acceleration of all those things. So revivals are kind of like gardens. They are taking us out of our resting place. Our resting place is anti-gospel. And the Holy Spirit, when revival comes, it's like a very intense diet. He yanks us out of that place and he brings us to a new place, a place that's usually uncomfortable. So, 
We can live our Christian lives always waiting for the big revivals. And some of you may live that way. Some of you may think, you know, oh, it's been so long since God really worked in my life. You know, like I haven't had those really big explosive moments where I'm on the ground crying or, you know, I see visions or something really radical happens. I haven't had one of those moments in a long time. And you can live like that, always waiting for those intense revivals, those intense diets. But what happens is people who depend on those intense moments, uh, it really, it just becomes like any other diet. You go back and forth, you swing from depression to highs and lows. I mean, it is just extreme. And when you don't experience that high, you feel like God did not. There is a better way. There is a better way, and that is a lifestyle of revival, a culture of revival. And this is where revival becomes the norm, not the exception, not something that is unique, but just something that is normal in your life. And it happens through small changes that you make in your life, and small changes in your perspective, where you begin to say, uh, something is wrong if I'm too comfortable in my spirituality. Something is wrong if the main thing I look for in my spirituality is comfort. Because the Holy Spirit is all about making people uncomfortable. Remember, the most important element of, of revival is conviction of sin. Because no one feels comfortable when they're convicted of sin. So, a culture of revival is a is a, is a presence of God, is a, a way of thinking about God, where you're always wondering, uh, what, what sins does God want to reveal more in my life? And, and you feel uncomfortable, actually, when God is not revealing sin in your life. So revival is the key. Revival is the key of taking this, whatever you have here, and bringing it here. That is the key, from here to here. Remember, Satan has this. Christians have this and this. And God's people have both. Uh, this is what makes Christianity exciting. When everything you know here is here, then Christianity is fun and exciting. When Christianity is just this, and mostly this, it's boring. It's terrible. It's hard. It's like, why am I doing this? What difference does this make? So how does everything here come down to here? Uh, here's what scripture tells us. I want us to look at Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 19. This is the Apostle Paul, and he's speaking to the church in Ephesus. He says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, what's interesting here is that I've mentioned this before, but the Apostle Paul is speaking to Christians. This is significant because what he says is he prays that Christ would dwell in their hearts, in Christians' hearts. He prays that Christians would know the love of God. Now, don't Christians already have Jesus in their hearts? And isn't it a minimum requirement for a Christian to know the love of God? I mean, isn't that like first level? Like if you don't know the love of God, how can you call yourself a Christian? Right? Like that's like the most basic level. That's how you come to be saved, by knowing the love of God. So isn't that strange that the Apostle Paul would be praying that Christians would know these things. 
And what we're seeing here is that it's possible for there to be different levels of presence and knowledge for Christians. That it's possible that Jesus can actually dwell more deeply in you. That he can be more present in you. There's something to that. And the key to growing in that heart knowledge of God's love, of his presence, his dwelling in you, the key to that is verse 16. It says that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. That's the key. Through his spirit, the Holy Spirit. You see, the distance, the distance between here and here is infinite. This, this distance, taking what's in your head and bringing it to your heart so that it's a reality. Uh, it doesn't matter if you go to church your whole life. It doesn't matter if you have a PhD in the Old and the New Testament. It doesn't matter if you are an expert in everything about the Bible. It doesn't matter if you have the greatest spiritual control and you have the world's best willpower to do whatever God tells you to do. It doesn't matter. You cannot do this. The reason salvation can only be accomplished by God himself through Jesus is that we cannot bridge this gap. Only the cross can. Only Jesus, only God can bridge this gap. And after salvation, after our initial salvation, when we receive forgiveness, when we receive eternal life, we still need God through the Holy Spirit to awaken the truth that's here and bring it to here. We cannot do it. Even if I am the world's greatest pastor, world's greatest preacher, and I have the best sermons prepared for you, I can never bring what's here to here. I might make it more interesting, I might make it more fun for you, I might do lots of cool things and great things with my words, but in the end, only the Holy Spirit can take what's here to here. So God is always the answer to moving out of our natural resting point and moving into divine rest. So at this point, the natural question might be, uh, how do I meet the Holy Spirit? How do I have him work in my life? Uh, this is where our passage comes into play. Uh, I want us to read the passage. I'll just read it for you. You can read along. This is, if you're not familiar, this is uh, the beginning of the early church, the first Christian. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Now, like I said, this is the first church beginning of the first church, first Christians. And this is also right before the Holy Spirit comes to Christians for the first time. What you need to see is that when the church came together to pray, the Holy Spirit responded. You can look at any major revival in history. Look at the one in Korea, Pyongyang Revival. A very famous revival started with prayer and repentance. You look at the Great Awakening in America, it started with prayer and repentance. Uh, you look at the famous revival in Scotland, it started with prayer and repentance. You look at more recent ones, there was one in Canada, there was one in California. Same thing, it happened with prayer and repentance. Think about your own walk with God. Think about your own personal walk with God. I guarantee if you look at the major turning points in your life with God, at some
some point there was prayer and at some point there was repentance. There was a conviction in your heart, I can no longer live this way. I need to turn around and go in a different direction. If you experience that repentance, that conviction, I need to move in a different direction. That is revival. And it always happens through prayer. <coughs> so wherever you find revival, you will also find prayer. Wherever you find prayer, you will also find the Holy Spirit responding and bringing revival. Now as I've been going through this gospel series with you, now some of you have been with us from the very beginning when I first started preaching about the gospel. What is the gospel? Uh, what does it mean for a church to be changed by the gospel? And I've been going through all of these things. Uh, and this is really one of the cornerstones of all these messages is everything I taught you up till now, everything I shared with you about the gospel, it is all garbage, all means nothing if the Holy Spirit doesn't take you from here to here. All it will do is make you prideful. All it will do is fool you into thinking I am a better Christian. But if it's not brought from here to here, the Holy Spirit does not do that work. It will mean nothing. It's just knowledge. It is just more words, more teaching. And as I've been doing this, I've been convicted myself that we as a church community, we don't actually pray together. Yes, we have an intercessory prayer team. Uh, before service, there are people who pray. I don't know if you knew this, but before service, there, there we have members who pray for an MEN. They pray for people in MEN, they have certain lists, and they pray, but you know, the intercessory prayer ministry is the shortest ministry in MEN. It's like 10, 15 minutes at most. I mean, they don't, my sermon is longer, our worship time is probably longer. Uh, it is not a vital part of ministry, and I'm sure that most of us here have never even been in that prayer meeting. Right? I mean, I'm sure maybe like 80 I've never been there, don't know that even happens. So I, I've been mistaken, I believe, in believing that as long as we have a sermon and as long as we have church music, uh, that we have all the necessary parts of the church. And I think that was a big mistake, looking back now. Uh, so, personally for me, I no longer want to do church that way. I no longer want to do church where the sermon is the most important part, because it really isn't. Um, if the Holy Spirit doesn't do anything, then you just keep learning things and it never changes you. So from now on, what I will be doing, and we're going to start this week, is we're going to start a dedicated prayer meeting. Um, a dedicated prayer meeting where we as a church can come together and pray together. And so from now on, the plan uh, is to have this prayer meeting. Uh, right now, I'm thinking Wednesday, uh, maybe from 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock, and it hasn't been set yet, but this is just something that I've been thinking about and about. And if our group gets larger, we can move to different venues, but uh, this is where we're going to start. And together, my hope is that we can really begin to pray with gospel power praying not so that we can get things from God, uh, but really praying so that we can just get more of God. And really asking the Holy Spirit to bring revival. Personal revival, corporate revival, that transfer from here to here, that really makes church beautiful. Right? It's not, it's not the, the, the graphics, it's, it's not the equipment, it's not our, our nice room, this is not what makes church beautiful. It is the work that the Holy Spirit does in changing us when he goes from here to here and that happens through prayer. So I hope that this is something that we as a church can really begin to do so that we begin to see what the gospel looks like in our lives. Let's pray. I'm just going to have us pray a very simple thing right now. And, uh, we're just going to Pray, Holy Spirit, would you awaken my heart? Holy Spirit, would you bring revival? Bring revival.
revival to my heart, bring revival to Mana English Ministry, bring revival to Mana Church, bring the truth of the gospel to our hearts, convict us of our sin, lead us into repentance. 